We come now to uh, worship God together and uh, we listen to some words from Psalm 145 and I've chosen them because they fit in with what Alistair is going to speak on in his sermon. Uh, Psalm 145 from verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of men your mighty deeds and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Let us now sing to God's praise our first hymn, The God of Abram Praise, uh, number 26. Uh, As far as I know, this is the only uh, true Jewish melody that we have. It comes from a uh, synagogue uh, service that we have this lovely hymn uh, regarding the God of Abram. So let us praise the God of Abram Praise who reigns enthroned above. we uh, come into God's presence and as we uh, confess our sinfulness and also ask for his pardoning mercy. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, you have not left us in darkness concerning yourself, but you have sent your own Son into this world of ours, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Thank thee for that message of the gospel uh, that comes to each one of us, calling upon us to repent and to believe and to know the 
grace that comes from the Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive us our sins. We have to pray that prayer day by day, and we do so individually, and we do so collectively this morning. If we have gone astray from you, if we have thought or said things that are contrary uh, to your law, forgive us. Cleanse us in the blood of the Lord Jesus, that we may, may be made whiter than snow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship again. The wonder of a day set apart, a day that speaks to us of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and also speaks to us of another Sabbath day that is yet to come, an eternal Sabbath uh, that is reserved up in heaven for your children. May each Sunday be a blessing to us and help us to see it as pointing forward uh, to that eternal Sabbath rest uh, that you have treasured up for your own. We pray for the uh, preaching of your word today that it may go forth in power uh, that you will use the faithful ministry of uh, many of your servants, uh, that the word of life may be proclaimed in its fullness and that people may come to trust and to believe in the Saviour. Uh, we pray for our homes and our families, for each one of us. Uh, we pray that you will receive us now and bless us, taking away every sin, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to our memory verse, uh, continuing with Philippians, Philippians 3.14. So we say Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press onward for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. <clears throat> Last Sunday, John Stasser started his sermon by commenting on the status that we have when we come to believe in the Lord Jesus. We're brought to, into a position with God uh, that we are reckoned to be saints, sanctified. Not that we are perfect, because the work of perfection has to go on right through our lives. It's only when we're brought into the very presence of God uh, that we will, we will be like the Lord Jesus and will be perfect. Let me say virtually the same thing in a different way this morning. When you look back at the Bible uh, as it depicts for us the way that sin came into the world, when Adam and Eve sinned, their status changed. They became rebels. They were sinners. But the next thing that changed was their condition changed along with that. And if you look to the early chapters of Genesis, you'll find that there is a progression. Men and women become more and more sinful until you come to chapter 6, uh, when God speaks a word of condemnation of those who have uh, gone their own way, uh, those who are seeking to fulfill uh, their own will, and then you come to the story of the, the flood. The state has changed. And then the condition changed. Now that has to be reversed. And that is what the gospel does. It changes our status. But then our condition has to change as well. How does it change our status? We become new creatures in Christ. We come to believe in the Lord Jesus. And we are now reckoned by God as part of his believing family. We are saints. But that doesn't mean that we are perfect. We have to grow. We have to go further in the Christian life. And that is what this verse is speaking to us about. What does Paul say? I press on. Isn't it amazing how Paul uses analogies from athletics to describe the Christian life? Is it easy being a Christian? No, says the Apostle Paul. You have to put forward all your energy in regard to it. You have to press towards the mark. You, you have to fight, not as someone beating the air. He uses analogies to try and say to his readers and to say to us, you have to put forward every effort to grow, 
to become more like the Lord Jesus, uh, to put sin aside and to seek by God's grace uh, to pattern yourself on that example that we've been given. And so this verse in Paul, he has spoken about forgetting the things that are behind and trusting in them. He says, I press on. I put forward all my energy to reach for the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So as we say it uh, today, and we'll be saying it again next Lord's Day, uh, we ask uh, God to, to give us that, that vision of uh, his people striving to become more like the Lord Jesus, seeking the strength and the blessing uh, of himself as we are more and more sanctified, as we are brought to that point where we become more like our Saviour. So we say again, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. And to accompany that, we sing uh, Rejoice 447. Rejoice 447, which carries on something of that, that theme. Uh, it speaks about... Uh, we count as loss any of our profits and our pride. Uh, it speaks about the righteousness that we have from the Lord Jesus. It speaks about the fact that we haven't obtained the prize, but we press forward and reach for Christ, our goal. So, hymn 447, the world has great rewards to give. Testament reading and as you know we try in a service to have both Old Testament and New Testament passages we believe it's very important for us to read publicly the scriptures so if you turn to page 420 in our church Bibles I'm going to read 
First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 9 to 22. So on page 420, starting at verse 9. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel our father, for ever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow when there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies and your statutes, performing all, and that that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs, with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. May God bless his word to us and help us to understand. John Stasser is now going to lead us in our pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you as those who stand in that historical line, connected even with the people of Israel and King David. We bow before you as your humble servants, but also as your joyful children, and we would bless your name. We acknowledge that you are the great and glorious God. There is none beside you. There is none like you who is rich in mercy, who is expansive in love, whose power is without limit, except for the limit of righteousness and goodness. You are kind and merciful in all your dealings with us, as indeed all your people. You've given us breath for this day, but you've also given joy in our heart to gather together to praise your name, to bring our gifts before you, to acknowledge your greatness, but also our utter dependence upon you, and to express the truth that the more we recognise our dependence, the more secure we are before you. For our security lies in Christ and in him alone. 
We rejoice in his saving work for us. We rejoice in the blessings that flow to us from that work. The cleansing of our sins. The quietening of our conscience. The joy of our praise. The hope as we look forward to this day and those that you may grant unto us. And above all, that eternal day that is coming according to your promise. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A growing church, an advancing church, a strong church, a God-glorifying church, a Christ-centred, Bible-founded church. Hear our prayer that this may be even more truly true of us as a congregation of your people and as individuals who together in Christ make up that congregation. And not only us, O Father, but all your people cause the gospel to be blessed in this day that even in the darkest days of rebellious sinners there might be a vibrant testimony to your saving grace in Christ Jesus. Protect your church. Strengthen the faith of those who are being persecuted, those whose faith are sorely tested in other ways. Help us, O Father, not to be distracted by the offerings of the world, but to see that Christ and all that is in him is better by far and by far. We do pray, O oh Father, for those who are not well amongst us, who are unable to gather with us this day. We pray for those who are in hospital, those who are facing surgery, that you would be their help, that you would give them comfort and confidence, that you would undertake. We thank you for those who are caring for them and will. We pray that you will bless those labours. We thank you, O oh Father, for... Uh, the Theological College, and as it prepares to get underway for a new year, may this be a year of great blessing for the students, for the lecturers and ancillary staff. May it be profitable for your church well into the future as a result. We pray for those who have exited and been licensed and have been appointed in their exit appointments. We pray that you would Bless their efforts, strengthen their sense of call. May their congregations love them and care for them. Be patient and gracious towards them. Helping them, coming alongside their new pastors. That they may grow into the role. And do so with a confidence that as pastor and people, they are serving you. But look upon us too, O oh Father. We pray for the board and the session as it continues to think into the future and prepare for the future as it unfolds in your goodness towards us. We pray that you'll prepare a man after your own heart, a man who will love you more than your people, but because they love you will love your people. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that you would accept our thanks for those who... Uh, are leading in the life of this congregation as elders, as managers and in other ways. We thank you for the opportunity to bring our gifts to the surface and to the life of the church here. May that continue. May we not be hesitant in so doing. We do pray, our Heavenly Father, for the nation in which we live, for those in authority over us, that they would have wisdom, that you would hinder the foolishness of sinful rebellion against you and your word. We pray for the nations around us, throughout the Pacific, throughout Asia. We pray, O oh Father, for the advancement of the gospel, for the strengthening of Christian witness. We do pray for the troubles in uh, Northern Europe. We do pray, O oh Heavenly Father, for common sense to prevail for peace to be maintained and restored and strengthened. We pray, O oh Father, for those who are troubled, 
We thank you for those who are seeking to honour Christ even in the midst of those troubles. We thank you, O Father, that our hope is not the continuance of our present life or its comforts or its joys, but as in Christ who is the King and Head of his Church, who rules over all. In his name we praise you. Amen. We're going to sing now from uh, 469 <clears throat> in Rejoice. This is a hymn by Horatius Bona. <clears throat> speaks about our uh, going on to labour and uh, uh, continue our work for the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we remain seated until the last verse uh, as the offering is uh, taken in the earlier part. Hymn 469. of how the people came and gave so gladly and willingly that they came recognising that all that they had came from you and what they were giving really was returning what you had bestowed upon them. May the same thought be in our minds and hearts as we come again today. Help us to recognise how good you have been to us. The blessings that we've received the ability that we have to bring uh, of what we own and to give it to, for the work of your kingdom. Bless it, we pray. And we ask again for the forthcoming meetings of the elders and of the managers, uh, that they may make good and wise decisions for the congregation that may lead us further in the forward to progress and especially with the establishment of a settled ministry. So be with us, we pray, and receive our thanks, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's good to be with you again in this new facility. Uh, it's very... Um, a great facility uh, that the Lord's provided for you. It's really great. Uh, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 6. Uh, 
and we'll sing from ver- uh, we'll read from verse one to verse fifteen. Again, <coughs> beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father Forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God. <clears throat> it's interesting and different, perhaps, to preach a sermon on words that aren't there. Uh, you will have noticed, as we, uh, as I read that, that the words "For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever." Amen. Uh, when I was young. Um, that's the way I learnt the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Maybe all of you learnt the Lord's Prayer the same way. And we need to think about that, what's going on here. But also, uh, not to get distracted, but to focus on things that that, that we can learn from the Lord from these words. This conclusion to the Lord's Prayer is missing from the modern versions. Now, it's not missing from the King James Version, it's not missing you know, from the authorised version that many of us were brought up on. And so we learned it the other way, because we were brought up that way. <clears throat> and, but it's not in the modern versions, and we might ask the question, why? Why is it not in the modern versions? And simply put, these words are not in some Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Because the New Testament was copied and Copies didn't always get it right, but when we've got enough copies, you can put them together and say, oh, okay, that's what's really going on. So it's not a problem, but there it is. And so it's not this, these words aren't in some of the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, those that many people consider to be the most reliable. And because modern translators believe these well-known words weren't in the original, they don't put them in their version. Often they put them in a footnote, but not always. Now, it's possible to have a big discussion about that. It's not bad to discuss this because it's a reality that you have to think about, that we have to think about. But that's not what we're going to do this morning. But there are some things that we can be clear on. See, first of all, what's going on? When, when the scholars... Believing scholars, not just unbelievers, believing scholars, weigh up the evidence uh, and they look at the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, many of them, um, they make tweaks in our translations. And you know if you've been reading the authorised version of King James and you read, say, the NIV or the ESV or some more modern version, I mean good versions, you see, "Mm, that's not exactly the same. What's going on here? Of course, it can just be a different way of saying the same thing, but also there can be little bits. Oh, that's, that's, how come that's not there? Or how come that's there and it's not here? Now, it possibly makes things clearer, but not changed, but sometimes it does change. And when we see something missing from our modern versions that we're familiar with, as here, 
At least we can do this. We can look at the rest of the Bible and ask, are these words, even though they're not here but I was brought up on them and I know them, are these words in line with what the rest of the Bible says? See, because at the end of the day, we're wanting to say, what does God say in his word? 66 books, correct? And so we may not find it here, but do we find it elsewhere? And that's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm asking the question, okay, without getting into a discussion about this manuscript, that manuscript and so on, but to say, these words, are they biblical words? And if they're biblical words, then how do we respond to them because it's God's word? Check what the rest of the Bible says. Are they true? And also ask the question, are they appropriate to pray? Because if they're true, then they are appropriate to pray. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I believe that we will find that they're appropriate to pray and we'll learn things about praying as we consider them. These words, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These words are giving reasons why God should answer us when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Because it starts, for, because, for yours is the kingdom. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's good to think about what that's doing. They're giving reasons. Why should God, why should our Father do these things? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Giving God reasons. And so I ask the question, is it biblical to give God reasons for why he should answer our prayers? Now this can almost seem too bold. And yet, is it biblical to give God reasons why he should answer our prayers? We believe why we think he should. Yes. I now may have mentioned this at another time, but if so, it's probably good to repeat it. Giving God reasons for answering our prayers is a good thing to do. Biblical? Yes. Why? Remember Abraham bargaining with God with the Lord to save his nephew Lot in Genesis 18. Remember that? That's pretty bold, isn't it? But he's giving God reasons. I mean, he... he um, I don't know... Well, some of you have been in a situation where people bargain. You know, This is what Abraham's doing. It's terribly bold. Now, he does it very reverently. He says, look, I'm dust and ashes, but, but, but look, really, if there's 50... You know, if there's ten less, can, the Lord says, "Yeah, that's fine." What about what about another ten? Right? He just bargains God down. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it tells us a lot about God, doesn't it? You know, that He's willing to to listen to us when we we interact with Him. It's, it's just amazing. But you see, Abraham also gives God a reason why it would be good for God to do this. And this is what he says. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? See what Abraham's doing? He's saying, God, this is what you're like. (laughs) Really, you you wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't put good, you know, righteous people, people who belong to you, Kill them along with the wicked and punish them? Yeah. He's put, giving God reasons why he should respond positively. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Or this Moses pleading, with the unfa- pleading for the unfaithful Israelites have been dancing around the golden calf, calf whom the Lord will destroy. What does Moses say? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent? See, he's praying for them. Lord, don't destroy them. See, because God says, look, it's okay. I mean, I can make you into a nation to replace them. And Moses says, no, no, Lord. What will it do for your name, for your reputation? See, he gives God a reason why he should not do it. We'll say some more about that in a minute. But see, he says, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? You see, God gives, uh, Moses gives God reason as he prays that God will not destroy Israel. He says, what would happen to your reputation if you did that? He gives God a reason. It's amazing. Or Daniel. 
Daniel's praying that the Lord would bring the exiles back from Babylon. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to his pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O Lord, O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. See, your reputation's at stake. See, you promised that you'll bring them back. See, Daniel knows, he reads his Bible, and he knows that 70 years is up, and it's time they went back. And see, But he, but he prays, and he gives God's reasons why God should do this. Psalmist says the same. He uses the same. Psalm 143. For your name's sake, preserve my life. Psalm 25. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, because it's great. Hear my prayer. Why? For your name's sake. For the sake of your reputation. You see, because what is God's good reputation? He's a merciful God. He's a forgiving God. He's a covenant-keeping God. For your name's sake, for your reputation, Lord, do this. See, now, are you with me? You know, that, that is, it's bringing God reasons to God why he should do something. So, it's biblical for us to give God reasons for him to answer prayers. And these words at the end of the, on the, of, of the Lord's Prayer that we're used to, for, because yours is the kingdom, the power, and the, is bringing reasons why God should answer these prayers that we've just prayed. Notice also, when we think of the reasons which we have just thought about, the reasons given by Abraham, by Moses, Daniel, the psalmists, are all God-centred reasons, aren't they? The God sent this saying, it's not about us, it's, Lord, think about, what, think about your own reputation. God-centred reasons. It's, now that's, that's, the sort of reasons that we should bring. It's biblical. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's you, Lord. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out? Did he? That's you. Why should they say about that, that about you, Lord? For your sake, Lord. For your sake, forgive me. Because that's your reputation. See, it's, it's Lord, this is why I should do it. See, I think we don't, uh, we don't always understand how... Prayer works in the Bible. Uh, you, if you think about the Psalms, for instance, you know. God is the great king, yes? The great king. Now, we are petitioners. Now, he's the great king who controls everything. He, it's his kingdom. And then we come as petitioners and we say to the great king, Lord, w will you do this for us? Here are reasons why you should. Now, it's not that he's, a, it's not, that he's a, not willing to do it, but he, he wants us to bring reasons. Um, it's good for us to bring reasons. And so, for us as well, giving reasons, giving God's sentence reasons is biblical. And then I've got in brackets here, do we pray that way? And not enough, I fear. And then I thought, I've got a scribble in the margin. Um, people of Bellarine Presbyterian Church, what do you want? What do you want God to do? I mean, I thought about that myself as I was coming to this, you know, down Fenwick Street. You know, what, what, what do I want? What do I want God to do? And then I thought to myself, what does God want me to think, want him to do? Because I can say, Lord, make it comfortable for me. Yeah, fill up the seats, but not too many. And yeah, yeah, you, you, I mean, you, you know how it can be. That's how we, if we get right down where we are, you know, we can be thinking that way. But what does the Lord want me to want? Thinking, the Lord wants me to want the gospel to go out in Geelong. Think, think. You come into, you come into uh, somebody mentioned this to me. <clears throat> you come into Bowen Heads today. Are there any people in Bowen Heads? It's a chopper block, isn't it? Are there any people in church in Bowen Heads? Well, here we are. Maybe there's some up the road. Look at all those people. And we ask the question, what do we want for the Bellarine? But you say, oh, that's impossible. I mean, can, all these people, I mean, people just aren't like that anymore. <laughs> all these people out there, they're lost and they're not bringing honour to God and they need him and his name would be, would be honoured and glorified if they were saved, wouldn't they? See, so I, I say to myself, okay, well, I say to you, because you, you're here, what do you want for the Bellarine Presbyterian Church? And then say, Lord, Lord, 
Lord, cause the gospel to go out in the ballerine. Use us as instruments just in the way that's best. It's not for our glory, Lord, but for yours, for the honour of the Lord Jesus here in the ballerine. Right? That all the churches here, that they would be gospel-centred churches and preaching the gospel and that you would bring people in and you'd move by your Holy Spirit because it will bring honour to your name and bring honour to the Lord Jesus. And it'll show people that you are the merciful, gracious God. And we'll, we, we pray, don't we pray? What, what do we pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How's that going to happen? Yes, of course we're praying that Jesus will come back again. But in the meantime, what, how will it happen? It happens by the spreading of the gospel. Isn't that true? And so I'm just saying here, here as I was thinking about this, and I just encourage you to think as well, brothers and sisters, in your congregation as we should think in ours. What, what, do we, what does God want us to want? And then what reasons are we going to bring? Lord, do this for your name's sake. Have mercy. Certainly, that's in, the, in these words at the end. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So it's about God. So it's biblical to give reasons for why God should answer. And the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer gives these reasons and, and the biblical characteristics of God which are relevant to him answering us. <coughs> and so we just have a look at them. Yours is the kingdom. It's obviously biblical because as we read, uh, as Alan read, yours is the kingdom, O Lord, you are exalted as head over all. And we know it's biblical that yours is the kingdom. Okay. As I said before, He's the absolute monarch. We may not... It's not easy for a get our heads around. We have uh, truth by a show of hands and who's boss by a show of hands. And, but our father's not like Queen Elizabeth. Well, that's not show of hands either. But she's a head of state, almost symbolic. Yes, yeah, she ticked the box, but we go on and do our own thing. And it can be that way with how many people... I don't know, but people on the, um, on the census can tick the box, Christian or whatever it might happen to be, and then go on about their business. That's how it can be. Okay. But we know this is true. God is the absolute monarch. We sing these words. They're just a form of Psalm 99a. Let the names, Psalm 99. Let the nations tremble for the Lord is reigning from his throne above the angels. Let the nations tremble for the Lord is reigning from his throne above the angels. Let the earth be shaken high above all nations is the Lord great King in Zion. Or Psalm 115, we know that it says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And then it says, All that pleases him, he does. All that pleases him, he does. See, he's the ruler over all. And so yours is the kingdom. That's biblical. Our God, our great Jehovah the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's come to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one to be asked to whom requests come. He's the monarch, and he's the only monarch. You see, Psalm 44, verse 6, it's not, you know, God's one amongst many or the best of the, of the, of the bunch. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I'm the first, I'm the last, and besides me there is no God. There's no other God. There's no other... We can get infected, I can get infected, by the, the spirit of the age, can't we? Right? But there is no other God and there's no other destiny except heaven and hell. That's it. It's not the bad people, the, good, the, the Christians, the really bad people and the good guys in the middle. That's just not how it is. And so these, this, is, this is him. And God is the controller. He's over all of that. And so we pray too. The, the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But not to Mary or to the saints or to Mary MacKillop or Mother Teresa or whoever it might happen to be. It's to God alone. And so it's appropriate that we pray, Father, answer us because you and you alone have the right, the authority. See, that's why we say yours is the kingdom. You have the right. You have the authority. It's yours. It's your kingdom. And so we, when we say your kingdom come, we're meaning... Make it that people, all people on earth, will recognise who you are, who Jesus Christ is, and submit to him. Because yours is the kingdom, whatever people out there think. Lord, answer us. And, of course, we pray. Another reason, yours is the power. 
And it's certainly biblical too, 1, Chron uh, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power. In your hand are power in might and might. God has power. It's the power that created the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the whole lot. And he said, let there be light, and there was light. God has power. We think of it in creation. He did it with spoken word more than, from what I gather, more than 100 billion galaxies. I don't even know what that looks like. Perhaps 70 billion trillion stars. That's a lot. And God did it. Our God did that. Yours is the power. What power? It's the power that keeps everything going. You see, it says in Hebrews 1 verse 2, He, the Son, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his, imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. If God pulled the plug, the universe would collapse, just like that. It doesn't go under its own steam. It's God is sustaining it all the time, all the time. That's power. Through his Son, the Lord Jesus. Yours is the power. What power? It's the power that raised Christ from the dead. Paul in, one, in Ephesians chapter 1 points to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That is, not just raised like people were raised in the Old Testament to die again. This was raised never to God die again. Death defeated. The start of the new creation 192 years ago, uh, 1,992 years ago, 1,992 years ago, give or take. That actually happened at start of when Jesus rose from the dead by the power of God. Yours is the power. And, and we could add more, the power that opened the Dead Sea, uh, the Red Sea, the power that broke down the walls of Jericho, the power that in Christ healed the sick, raised the dead, opened the prison doors, freed Peter, Open the heart of Lydia so that she would believe the gospel. This is God's power. He, he has done these things. Um, he, he, maybe we don't think about this, but he, he turned our hearts around when we were rebelling against God. That's power. That's power. And that's why we pray, Lord, please do it more and more because yours is the power. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth in, as it is in heaven. Why? Because yours is the power. That's why we're praying. We're not really... Of course, there are hands and feet that are ours to do things. But first of all, it's praying, Lord, that you will go ahead, that you will move by your Holy Spirit. Um, uh, there are people here, um, uh, um, Alan and John and uh, John up the back and... Uh, others as well, I'm sure, who, who, who could tell you or give you books to read about revivals. You know. When revivals come, the pubs close and the churches is filled. Things change. No, they change. It's fair dinkum change. It's hearts change because the Holy Spirit comes and people are converted and that's the power of God. And that's the thing. I See, I think I get in a situation, mm, someone asks, Hmm. Uh, what are your expectations? Did, did they do? Is that Spurgeon? Some, some, someone asked. Spurgeon asked. Some, you know, what his minister was it? Um, what his expectations were? Are you expecting people to be saved? Oh, wasn't so sure. Well, it's no wonder they're not being saved. You know, you're not expecting them to be saved. Now, it's not just by you know I whip up my expectations and people will be saved, but it's almost like I'm not saying it's necessarily in Ballerine, brothers and sisters. I don't know. But I'm just saying how this can happen to me. Things just tick along. You know, it's not too bad. No. But the desire that people will actually be saved and the Holy Spirit will be working and that power will be at work. Lord, yours is the power. Your kingdom come. Our Father has absolute power. He can and is able to answer any of our prayers. Yours is the power. And yours is the glory too. Answering these prayers which we ask in the Lord's Prayer will bring glory and honour to our Father that he deserves. Hear us, for yours is the glory. Our Father in heaven deserves the glory. As I quoted Psalm 115 before, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory. 
Because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, you see. There's a reason why you should do it. It's amazing. When you start looking at biblical prayers, you'll start seeing them giving reasons time and time again. And answering our prayers is a sign of his steadfast love and faithfulness to us, even us, his people. All glory to him. Yours is the glory. You see, he deserves the glory to answer these prayers because we read at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine, this is us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But it's as people see and they change, they bring glory to God. He deserves the glory. And what does it say? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, he deserves the glory. But the interesting thing about that is if you keep going on reading beyond that, Paul says, when he says, eat and drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, he goes on saying, I try to please everyone in every way in order that some people might be saved. See, salvation of souls brings glory to God. It does. And that's why we pray. Yours is the glory. Your kingdom come. That is, may your kingdom come. For yours is the glory. You deserve it. So answering us will bring our Father glory. Now, of course, for all the things, you know, it should, when, when he provides us with food, give us this day our daily bread. Glory to God. That's fantastic. There are people starving in the world and it's not us. You know, God is... Now, of course, we pray and we care for these people, but... Answering us will bring our Father glory. When our Father responds positively, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, he'll be honoured. He will get the glory he deserves. Think about it. Hallowed be your name. The more his name, his character, who he really is, is acknowledged as holy, the more he is acknowledged as free from all evil and completely good, hallowed be your name, the more he will be honoured and glorified. Is that true? Yes. Hear us, O Lord, for yours is the glory. Your kingdom come, your will be done. The more Heavenly Father's rule is acknowledged and submitted to, the more the gospel spreads and the Lord Jesus is willingly trusted and followed and served in all of life by more and more people. This will bring him glory. When he provides for our needs, as I just said, and more, when he forgives fully and freely, as he says, Lord, forgive us our sin, and when he does for Jesus' sake, when he supports us in our battle against sin, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What does that do for us? Well, what it should do is we say, thank you, Lord, all glory to you. You've been with me today, all glory to you. When you answer these requests of ours and the disciples' prayer, yours is the glory. So, brothers and sisters, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory may or may not be words that Matthew wrote, but they're biblical words, they're appropriate words, they're good words to pray at the end of the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer. Reasons for our Father to answer us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, forever. Amen. Let's pray. The Lord God, we do pray, Heavenly Father, that we pray to you because you have all power to do things and to respond, and you're gracious and kind. Yours is the kingdom, you're the king who is over all, and your son is at your right hand, and you are putting all things under his feet. Lord God, and you deserve the glory. You do. Not us, not to us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. Lord, we pray that you, all, all glory to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ. Amen. I thought it would be appropriate if we end by singing the Lord's Prayer that we've uh, quite often sung. It is uh, 512 in Rejoice. Father God in heaven, Lord most high. We know it so well, so I'm suggesting that uh, we sing with the music on only the first and the last verses.
The middle verses we sing without the music, we sing a cappella, which means uh, according to the choir, that is in medieval church, they used to sing without the music. So the first and the uh, last verse with the music, uh, verses two, three, and four, we'll sing uh, without it. Thank you, John. Thank you for the reminder we have had this day that the kingdom belongs to you and the glory and the power. May that be a realisation that impinges upon all that we do, that we may know day by day that we have a God who is over all, that his power is able to change people's lives and whole communities, and that you are the one to whom we are to render the, the praise and the glory. Go now, we pray, with the blessing of the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May it rest upon us now and always. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing 635 uh, to finish with. And I've chosen that deliberately because, again, it ends on the theme that we've been thinking about. The kingdom, the dominion, and the glory will be yours evermore. 635. <clears throat>